This video is sponsored by Brilliant. What if you had two hearts? It's a silly and speculative question, I know, but just stick with me here. What if you did? Where would they even be in your body? What size would they need to be? I mean, could one be larger than the other or they have to be the exact same size? How would blood pressure be affected when you have two pumps just pushing blood throughout your entire body? I mean, could you make it so that each heart supplies a different aspect of your body? I mean, again, these are silly, but yet they are interesting questions. So let's figure it out. The chest seems like the most logical place for a second heart, considering the rib cage and sternum are already there to provide protection. Now, instinctually, I want to mirror the original heart with it side by side at the midline, projecting to the right. But as you can see, there's not a lot of room in the thoracic cavity and especially on the right side, given that the right lung has three lobes. So one of those lobes would have to go away in order to make room for the heart, just as it did with the left lung, which only has two lobes. But that would mean a decrease in overall respiratory function, making it more difficult to get enough oxygen to all of the tissues. The body would need to adapt to lower oxygen levels, meaning that it would likely increase red blood cell count just as it does in higher elevations. But the problem with that is that you're contributing to a higher blood pressure. Plus, assuming both hearts are pumping into the same vasculature, blood pressure is going to shoot through the roof. This could be a huge problem for the smallest blood vessels in the body called capillaries, but especially those capillaries in close proximity to the hearts themselves. With enough pressure, they would just explode, causing blood loss throughout the body. One option is to split up the vasculature, essentially creating a binary circulatory system. So for all my fellow nerds out there, this is how the doctor from Doctor Who does it, but you'd basically have two separate cardiovascular systems. Now, you'd still have options though, with those separate systems on how you want to get and deliver the blood to the various tissues. If we're aiming for redundancy, meaning if one heart goes down then the other takes over, having both circulatory systems travel the same pathways makes the most sense to me. The body wouldn't need to reorganize the tissue that much to accommodate the new vessels, although I'm not so sure there'd be a balanced venous return to the respective hearts. What I mean is veins only have 10% of the pressure that arteries do and rely heavily on muscle contractions to return blood to the heart. It's possible that your day-to-day -day activities would lean to one circulatory system more than the other, even if it's just at certain times and with certain activities. So unless both hearts are always contracting in unison, you're also going to have differing flow rates in the blood vessels, which would also affect the delivery and return of the blood to the hearts. Since we haven't increased the amount of fluid in the bloodstream, this could create some dramatic imbalances, which would likely have ripple effects on the working efficiency of other organs and tissues in the body. It's possible that having one heart pump while the other rests could help balance this out though. Essentially, you'd have a continuous delivery of blood to all of the tissues in the body. If you did this, you wouldn't even need to have two circulatory systems. Both hearts could pump into the same vessels, although you still could have duplicate vasculature if you wanted. If that's the case, every tissue in the body would have to adapt to the steady flow of blood, allowing for proper nutrient and waste exchange, which is an enormous task. Every organ in your body operates within a contracting and resting phase in the cardiac cycle. Pretty much every organ and tissue would have to adapt, which would be more difficult for some than it is others, but it's still gonna be an insane amount of work. But I wanna really quickly think about what an increase in blood flow would do to some of these tissues. The skeletal muscles stand to gain the most here, although it would take time for them to fully adapt. Considering they're able to utilize nutrients and oxygen at a much more consistent rate, it seems that stamina and recovery would also increase, assuming waste removal is sped up as well. For other organs, I don't know that a steady blood flow would actually help them all that much though, even over time. Everything in your body is optimized for your current flow of blood. Just because you're now providing a steady flow of nutrients and oxygen doesn't mean necessarily that the organs are going to become more effective or efficient. If anything, it's now more difficult for them considering they have to help manage this new heart in your body. You have to understand that every organ system in your body evolved alongside the other systems. Changing one system doesn't mean the other systems will respond in kind. We also need to consider heart rate. So while the hearts might be beating normally on their own, let's say about 80 to 100 beats per minute, the combined heart rates would be 160 to 200 beats per minute at rest, which just sounds utterly exhausting. Again, this is without exercise. Another option is to split the duties of each heart. So while one heart is pumping to the internal organs of the body, 
The other heart might be pumping to various tissues such as muscle, bone, and skin. Now personally, this option just makes the most sense to me. Since we're not focused on redundancy here, you could actually adjust the sizes of the hearts according to what they supply. So the heart that's in charge of organ function could be smaller, and as long as it's still in the chest, it should be able to apply or supply enough pressure to the brain in order to continue normal function. Its primary blood vessels could just be traveling vertically. So you'd have one coming off of the heart, heading towards the head and neck, and then another one heading towards the chest and abdomen. And then you'd have all these offshoots branching off of it to supply the various organs with blood. And then in order to return blood back to that heart, you'd have all these small veins coming off of the organs, which would then filter into two larger primary veins that would then enter into the heart. Now your heart already does this, so we know it works, but now essentially you've completed the loop. The other heart could be larger, but it would still need to be smaller than the one we currently have. Now this larger heart should also handle respiration on top of muscle, skin, and everything else, meaning it would send vessels to and from the lungs. It would also need to supply that smaller heart with oxygenated blood since the smaller heart isn't contributing to the lungs at all. Now you'd also have to have a vein that takes deoxygenated blood from that smaller heart back to the bigger heart, but that probably isn't too difficult to do. But as much as this layout makes sense to me, there's a pretty big problem here, and that is how do you get fresh nutrients as well as filter the blood in both of those circulatory systems? Kidneys and liver are the only organs that need to connect to both circulatory systems. Otherwise, uric acid is going to build up in the bloodstream, and without nutrients, things are going to get very bad very quickly. As long as we have both systems converging at the renal artery, which delivers unfiltered blood to the kidney, and then both systems splitting at the renal vein, which returns filtered blood to the bloodstream, we should be good in terms of filtering. Then, once nutrients have been absorbed by the small intestine and processed by the liver, the nutrient-rich blood can be given to both hearts, providing essential nutrition to the cells supplied by each circulatory system. In my eyes, this is your best bet, and it is far from optimal. I mean, this doesn't even take into account the endocrine system and how glands will get hormones to all the various tissues, but I think this is the best potential layout out of all the potential layouts. What do you think? Do you agree with me? Or did I get something wrong? Or maybe just forget about a whole bunch of stuff altogether? Let us know in the comments below because we'd really like to hear your feedback on this one. I wholeheartedly believe that this type of logical and scientific thinking is extraordinarily valuable to people in all walks of life, not just those in the scientific and medical disciplines. In fact, it's one reason I'm such a big supporter of the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn math, science, and computer science interactively. They have thousands of lessons and are adding more each and every month. In preparation for this video, and this is 100% true, I spent several hours challenging myself with their lessons on logic. While I'm pretty good at explaining how things already are in the body, it's a totally different way of thinking when it comes to how things could be. Brilliant helped me get into that headspace by providing me with if this, then that, or what's really just properly called logic, type challenges that were bite-sized yet highly intuitive. And considering how interactive they are, you become really immersed in it, and yet you're still having fun. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash IHA, or you can just click the link in the description below, and the first 200 of you will get 20% off your annual premium subscription. Doesn't get much better than that. Thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you in the next video.